we've had a really good introduction to the th basic theme of what I want to talk about today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Robert and uh, what Robert said in his prayer and also Arlene. Our theme today is see Christ among us. And naturally, our thoughts go to where do we see Jesus? If we asked each person on Zoom today, we'd find that there were many places and many ways that we experienced Jesus. Somehow the wording of the theme, seeing Christ among us, to me has an active connotation. It sort of also has a sense of mystery, like where is he? Is he right by me and I don't recognize him? Is he that man I just passed in the grocery aisle? Maybe he's the young trainee standing at my door sharing the benefits of his bug and pest services. What unexpected unexpected place might he be. A substitute for the word among is in the middle of. So if we use that, that would change the theme to be seeing Christ in the middle of us. <clears throat> and that wording makes it pretty clear. Use your memory way back to 2019 and think when we had social gatherings in the fellowship hall at church. And imagine standing in the narthex and looking through the open doors to the group attending the chili supper or the ice cream social. And right there in the middle is Jesus. Isn't that an amazing picture? Just think, it's like that in every scene we might dream up where we are the humans. It is a call to closer attention to the spirit working in the world and with us personally. Seeing the Christ in people is certainly a worthy goal. Last week, Ron talked about whole life stewardship. Today, I hope to continue his whole life stewardship idea. So if last week was whole life stewardship 101, today is whole life stewardship 101 continued. Ron discussed loving your neighbor and your God. The parable of the Good Samaritan contains a scripture that comes easily to mind. In response to the lawyer's question of what must be done to inherit the kingdom, Jesus tells the lawyer to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That is something that I think most of us learned at a young age. We must have self-love to function properly in all the circumstances that life throws at our way. Equating our love of self, self with how we are commanded to love others is a strong message. I'd like to share, um, oh boy, just a minute, you guys, um, a story about a group of children in Africa. And I have it here on my phone, I hope. Hang on, I'm sorry. Here it is. The anthropologist invited the children from the African tribe to play one game. He placed a basket of fruit near the tree and announced, addressing the children, the one of you who reaches the tree first will be rewarded with all the sweet fruits. When he signaled to the children to start the race, they locked their hands tightly and ran together. And then they all sat together and enjoyed the delicious fruit. The astonished anthropologist asked the children why they all ran together, because each of them could enjoy the fruit for himself. To which the children replied, Obanato. Is it possible for one to be happy if everyone else is sad? Abonato in their language means, I exist because we exist. I kind of think that's um, what we want to know here. Our scripture today is from Matthew 25, verses 41 to 63. And it's part of what Jesus taught during the Sermon on the Mount. It is some of his last teachings before events happen that led to his crucifixion. Because it is the last teaching, it has been suggested that it might be an especially important message. Unexpectedly, our scripture today 
features two farm animals, goats and sheep. We're not surprised that sheep are in the scripture as sheep are often mentioned in the New and Old Testaments. In fact, a Google search said that sheep are mentioned over 500 times, but goats? Goats are reportedly mentioned 46 times. And usually the writer is referring to goats as actual animals, and usually it's in terms of an animal for Old Testament sacrifices. Well, today's scripture is not about goats being sacrificed, but instead goats are used symbolically. And again, this scripture is one you're probably all very familiar with. But when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Before him, all the nations will be gathered and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will tell those on his right hand, come blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will answer them. Most certainly I tell you, because you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will also say, also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in, naked and you didn't clothe me sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't help you? Then he will answer them saying, most certainly I tell you, because you did not do it to one of these, you didn't do it unto me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, the Sermon on the Mount is called to obedience. That's not a law or a sacrifice, but a way of life that makes for joyful living in mercy towards others without an agenda. It has no thought of a reward. The goats, the ones on the left, seem to lack an awareness of the need of others. Their reward, which is eternal punishment, seems to be a conflict between being saved by your good works and being saved by the grace of God. Keeping my time short, I'm not going to talk about salvation by works and salvation by grace. I'm going to leave that topic for someone else to explain another Sunday. But I do want to talk about the sheep and, and their actions. So Jesus, I think, is teaching about a code for the early Christians to understand and a code that we can live by in the year 2020. Jesus illustrated by using the sheep and the goat metaphor. We might think of it as there are the do's and the did nots. The do's are the ones who do when they see a need. They are the sheep. They see a need and they reach out to do what they can. There are many kinds of needs. The best thing about the doers is that they met the needs of others out of their love for their fellow humans. They don't help others as a way to make their way to eternal life. They recognize like the little boys from Africa that they exist because we exist. What amazing to me is that those on the right, the sheep, the good guys, didn't even seem to remember their good deed 
and certainly didn't connect it to doing it for God. They didn't yet understand that Christ is in each person and doing good deeds is a way to honor God. We might think of it as their code of life. It was their whole life stewardship in action. We know that people during the time of Jesus were uh, accustomed to helping the poor. The Torah law required landowners to leave the edges of their fields unharvested so that the widows and orphans might obtain food by gleaning it. People had to work together to keep themselves afloat. I have one personal example of that kind of caring and Robert alluded to the same thing. Recently, Larry and I and others in the congregation have been the recipients of prepared meals from our members. Those offerings of meals to those of us in need was a wonderful ministry. We so appreciated the thought and the food. I know the others who received this kind of ministry were also blessed. None of these wonderful cooks gave a thought to their place in eternal life when they decided to cook up some good food. Jesus talked about six different works that bless. It was food, drink, hospitality, clothing, nursing care, and visitation. The six kinds of needs used in this scripture are examples, but by no means the only needs individuals can have. A kind word or listening ear can help a person in despair. Assistance with a flat tire can save the day. Knowing one is thought about by receiving a greeting card can put sparkle into one's day. There are other kinds of needs that are not so apparent. The possibilities for showing mercy uh, to our fellow human beings are limitless. Larry's mother was a good example of recognizing the needs in people's lives. She was the county relief officer in Fremont County, Iowa for most of the time that I knew her. Her job entailed serving the low income families and individuals by providing them with supplies and food pantry items funded from the county budget. For instance, food stamps, which is a state funded program, uh, were not allowed to be used to purchase like toilet paper, feniman hygiene items, deodorant, maybe laundry soap. And it was her job and it was her passion to do as much as she could to fill in the needs for what the state didn't cover. Many Thanksgivings and Christmas mornings when we arrived to have our family gatherings, she was finishing collecting and delivering gifts to some of her clients. Her acts of generosity weren't limited to her clients. She reached out to others in the community that she knew. I remember hearing my father-in-law say that she would give away her last $20 if someone needed it. This year, you may have noticed in the Herald the theme, moving toward the peaceful one. The sheep of this world are doing that. Ever without thinking, they are doing that, moving toward the peaceful one. To the doers, it's a natural reaction to the needs they see and act on out of the kindness of their hearts. It is the code they live by. It is the code I see members of this congregation living by. So why talk about it today? Well, one thing is that it's a sign for today, but also it's a good thing to be, be reminded of how we are to reach out. In being a doer, we see the needs in others and we also see the element of Christ in others. We are guided by the love of compassion and hospitality that God places within us. We find ourselves doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. When we carry the Holy Spirit with us and interact with the least of these, we see others as God sees them. They are not just humans, but humans created and loved by God. We become the feet, hands, and arms of God. Our code of living, using our whole life stewardship, blesses others, not because of the promise of eternal life, but because we follow the urging of the Holy Spirit. We walk in the stead of Christ. May we find ourselves moving toward the peaceful one in our daily walk. In doing so, we find joy, not because we do something good, 
but because we share in the joy it gives to those we help. My prayer is that we will be found moving forward toward the peaceful one. Thank you.